All right, so um, thanks Brad and thanks to the team for inviting me to speak tonight. Um, and as Brad said, I'll be talking to you about um, atrazine and explaining a little bit more about how that might be impacting our fertility. So as you can see from the title of my talk, I'm a little bit of fan of The Handmaid's Tale, which potentially, um, hopefully everybody's been watching um, and understands what's going on in that arena. So really it's of course, as we're showing here, it's a dystopian universe where uh, fertility has crashed in our population and uh, due to unknown causes uh, with only a few people left to reproduce. So just keep that in mind as we go through our talk. I don't think it's gonna get quite so dire in the next 25 minutes, but let's see how we go. Um, so as Brad said, I'm a reproductive biologist and uh, my lab for the last eight years has been undertaking studies to understand how the environment and specifically endocrine disrupting chemicals affect fertility. So I think you all know about endocrine disrupting chemicals and the fact that they're absolutely everywhere and really absolutely cannot escape them. And this really is been uh, brought about by the last sort of um, since the end of the Second World War, where we now have something like 90,000 chemicals that are now man-made, of which to date about 1,500 of these are now currently classified as endocrine disrupting chemicals. So I know we've got lots of diverse people on here in terms of their background and, and science and knowledge in this area. So I thought I'd just start with a couple of slides um, on the area before going into presenting some of the work that I've been doing specifically on atrazine. So in terms of EDCs, you can see here, then most, of the, most people will be well aware of this group here, which are the bisphenols, and that are commonly found in plastic water bottles, in the lining of your coffee cup, in the lining of tin cans, and of course, coating our till receipts, or that shiny film there. So BPA uh, commonly, of course, is working through the estrogenic pathway, um, as well as other sites, um, and is a very, very prevalent endocrine disrupting chemical. Associated to bisphenols with a very similar structure of the parabens, and these are commonly found in a lot of our personal care items. And so these are in, um, usually because uh, ladies, you like to take care of yourself a little bit more than we do, five times higher concentrations found in human females than males. Again, working through estrogenic pathways. Um, and lastly, in this category, I guess, or this grouping, we have the phthalates. And so these are generally found in, in plasticizers and obviously for making things softer in terms of plastic tubing or flooring or toys. Um, and like the first two categories can act through estrogenic pathways, but tend to be what we call an anti-androgen. And so stopping the effects of things like testosterone. Collectively, these three categories or groups of compounds are really found to be uh, metabolized quite fast out of our bodies. Um, and so if you're stopping exposure, generally you can drop your levels quite fast. Unlike probably things that you more classically consider endocrine disrupting chemicals, and these are things that stay in our bodies for a very, very long time. And these include the persistent organic pollutants of which there are many super families underneath this category. So you're probably more aware well of things like the PCBs and the dioxins. So mainly the sort of the flame retardants that's found on your furniture and your carpets, things that were probably found in the paints and things that have now classically been actually um, banned in consumption since the late 1970s in some cases, but they are fairly, fairly prevalent. This probably epitomizes what we think of when we think about EDCs and that's the pesticides and the herbicides. And those can be for um, mainly for the agricultural domain, but also when you're thinking in terms of things that you probably use in the home as well. So you've got lots of things that you'll use around the house, whether it's um, the bug spray at night or something that you might use in your garden. And this, of course, will be the category that I'll be talking about more to tonight. Under this heading of the POPs, we have also the PFAS, and that's something that myself, Brad, and many of the people, no doubt, on the call tonight um, have been looking into. And this is a hot topic in terms of um, some of or understanding some of its implications for those um, being exposed to it. When we also think of EDCs, then we can think of things that go into the air, so the air pollutants, and that can be not necessarily from well industrialized um, countries, but also those in the third world. Um, and more recently, of course, the technology in terms of fracking and the release of some of the compounds into our groundwater. And lastly, not really truly an EDC, but um, we like to categorize it in that sense in terms of the effects on fertility, are uh, the EM radiation that we've all got from our cell phones burning a hole in our pocket. So these seem to cover many of the, the main categories. Um, of, as I said, many of them are huge superfamilies, of which some of the compounds have more severe consequences than the others.
So how do we actually get exposure to them? And of course, there are many different ways of these as well. Classically, a lot of these sadly are found in our water. Also in our food, not necessarily directly in our food, but more lightly in the surrounding packaging or they get absorbed into our food and, and ingested. When we think of things like the parabens here, then a lot of these are topically applied. And so there's a lot of dermal absorption. If you think about conditioner, uh, shampoo, those sort of things and creams. And many of the compounds, of course, uh, form part of our house dust and are obviously brought in through inhalation. Lastly, we know here, this is indicating to me that um, we know that there are a lot of uh, groups of workers who are having high concentration and exposure to these compounds. So we know, for example, that hairdressers and panel beaters um, have a higher rate and take longer to conceive generally. And, we, and because of their continual exposure to some of these compounds, there is a lot of evidence to show that occurs. But tonight I'm really focusing, um, I guess, in terms of the EDCs in the pesticide and specifically the herbicide and our consumption or exposure through ingestion in water. So why why fertility? Why is that really good as a marker for something for us to study? Um, well, we like to call it the canary in the coal mine of health. So we know, for example, that um, looking from a lot of wildlife studies, we know that exposure to endocrine disruptors, whether it's in alligators or classically in bald eagles and some of the um, animals in the Arctic, um, then you can see that they, we know that they have trouble in terms of their fertility, in terms of conception, or in the case of the bald eagle, exposure to things like DDE and DDT, affecting the, the strength of the eggshell itself, which meant that those animals then suffered a population decrease. So these studies have really been documented since about the 1970s onwards, with the endocrine disruptors and the first publication terming that uh, in the 1990s. So what about in the human arena? So actually there are some very, very good studies um, with up to 50 to 60,000 people across multiple countries indicating that actually um, both in males and females, although this just shows in males, that semen quality is highly correlated to our mortality. Um, so when we look at things in terms of classic sperm parameters, in terms of the motility or the morphology or the count, um, then this, as I said, is correlated with life expectancy. And for those of you who suffer with kids, uh, like myself, then I should, just should say that it's not associated with the presence or absence of kids. This is independent of that, um, as we know that children seem to age us anyway. Um, and when the studies have actually looked in this large scale, then we can see that this is greater than 90% predictive ability. Um, and in fact, it actually has um, a risk in terms of poor fertility is associated with the risk of mortality as strong as something as smoking and diabetes. So it really is a really, really good tool for understanding um, if we're exposed to an inappropriate environment or in our case, EDCs, then the first thing that's likely to go is reproduction because as we know, that's a luxury in our body unlike most of our other organs. So for me and for my lab, then I guess we really use fertility as a very good proxy for indicating the health. Um, and, I, and this fertility really is our canary in terms of studying um, the consequences on all different species. So when we come to humans, we know quite a bit about how endocrine disrupting chemicals or EDCs affect human fertility. And this diagram here on your screens, you can see the difference in terms of male and female. So classically, um, believe it or not, your main sex organ is above your waist, it is your brain. Um, and we know that inappropriate exposure to endocrine disrupting chemicals before um, you're born often sets down different pathways and neural processes that mean that you respond differently once you go through puberty. And so this is a very, very uh, important area of study. Then the classically, of course, there's lots of the endocrine system that can be affected by the endocrine disrupting chemicals here. And these generally indirectly affect our reproductive health. But when we move down here into the areas that are actually bolded here in terms of the male, then the testis and the penis, um, then we know that um, exposure to endocrine disrupting chemicals can lead and is associated with a higher incidence of many diseases and disorders. So the term hyperspadius here is the most prevalent disorder that males are born with in Victoria. So one in 120 males that are born in Victoria have hyperspadius. And this is the inappropriate opening um, on the penis of the urethra. So it isn't quite at the tip, it's anywhere along um, the shaft to the base. Equally know that um, there's higher rates of cancer when we're exposed to things like endocrine disrupting chemicals. And on the female side, ovarian function, 
So polycystic ovarian syndrome, or PCOS, again, one of the most prevalent um, disorders faced around the world with over 100 million women suffering from this. Endometriosis and cancer. All three of these are, there's large, study come, large studies around showing that exposure to endocrine disrupting chemicals can increase their incidence. So after that depressing thought, if we are actually able to conceive, then of course the effects of endocrine disrupting chemicals don't stop there. So we know that actually exposure can change the fetal growth rate and actually retard fetal growth in utero. We know there's a high incidence of preterm birth and also sadly stillbirth um, with women exposed to endocrine disrupting chemicals. So across all the literature and for I guess for the last uh, 12 or 15 years when there have been a, a really rapid increase in the number of studies that have been undertaken, we can categorically say there is strong and good evidence for exposure of certain compounds in terms of males. You can see that a decreased sperm motility and increased DNA damage, so impairing the sperm's ability to really fertilize. In the female, we know that we have increases in menstrual cycle length, decreases in the hormone estrogen and egg number and egg quality. And in terms of conceiving, we know it takes longer for couples to conceive and sadly an increased miscarriage rate. But I guess the main take home message from this slide in human fertility is there is a lot of unknown. And as my friend offered up here is going to tell you, um, really the main message to take away from this that there are really are very few studies that have been undertaken um, relative to all other studies and especially in females. So where, where there have been studies, they technically usually involve probably the classic eight to 10 well-studied compounds of the 1500 that have now of course been categorized as EDCs. And I guess more importantly, just because there is no statement around an effect of an EDC on fertility, um, usually means that it has not been studied rather than there is no effect. And that's a very important thing to remember when we consider their effects. So that leads to what's happening in my lab and research in my lab. And I use a number of different species to uh, explore the effects on fertility. I use cattle in the sense that um, we use abattoir derived material to do IVF or in vitro fertilization and study both the, um, the egg and the embryo. I use mice um, because of their quick intergenerational time to look at in vivo studies and human studies um, so we can get samples from patients going, undergoing IVF clinics. So really uh, the first re reason we're doing this is to delineate the direct effects on the gametes and the embryo. And by gametes, I'm referring to the sperm and the eggs. So really I'm trying to look without the body and the indirect effects of the whole endocrine system having effects on them, if we directly expose them to inappropriate or endocrine disruptors that aren't normally found there, what happens? Both in terms of the gametes, the embryo, and later of course we can do those whole animal studies to look at how the whole systems interact when there are endocrine disruptors present and looking to reproductive disorders. Important to notice, we want to see what's happening across multiple generations. And um, as you can see here, a pregnant female was not just exposing herself and her fetus, but actually even the next generation because the ovaries or the testes of that fetus are also present during that time. So findings to date were that my lab was one of the first in the world to um, identify that bisphenol A affects the development and the metabolism of an embryo. Um, and that was very important because until then there were just large epidemiological studies showing a very high correlation between exposure to BPA and obesity without really understanding the mechanism behind it. Since then, uh, as we know, endocrine disrupting chemicals are a, a, a nasty chocolate box of choice. There are plenty to choose from in which to research. And so then I moved on to the area of atrazine and that's something I'll be talking about tonight, specifically on the effects on embryo development. I've also looked in terms of its cause uh, in terms of male infertility and driving that disease of hyperspadius. And currently, some of the other compounds I'm looking at include PFAS and parabens. Um, but really, it's not about us being uh, right at the end of the process. Um, our lab is now trying to be in the front of the process, working with a lot of manufacturers to try and test some of these compounds before they actually get used in the process and have some harm. So what is atrazine? Atrazine um, is the second most utilized compound in terms of a herbicide in Australia. It's a triazide herbicide, and so you might know things like simazine as a closely related compound, all of which are determined to act on the electron transport chain and have a metabolic effect on plants.
So this means they are heavily applied to things like golf courses, uh, crops in terms of uh, canola, for example. And you can see some pretty staggering figures that are actually out there. So in Australia, generally, we put on about 3,000 tonnes of atrazine every year, um, which is actually relatively little compared to what's going on in the United States, with 34,500 tonnes being applied every year. It's a highly persistent chemical. It has a half-life in soil of around about 150 days um, and in water greater than 100 days. And you can see some pretty terrifying levels um, that are found in our Australian waterways. And um, of course, these are very seasonal, uh, depending on the rain conditions and the, the intensity of the spraying and of course, the location relative to agriculture, but up as high have been measured as 2.4 milligrams per litre in Queensland. And these are comparable to ones that we might find, for example, in the United States. So atrazine, unlike most endocrine disrupting chemicals, is quite unusual. It's one of the only, only a few that really regulated in our consumption in terms of human drinking water and therefore are actually regulated. So in Australia, it's actually taken to not be allowed to exceed 20 parts per billion in Australian drinking water. And this notably has been based on a two year study of um, adult male rats treated at 0 0.5 milligrams per kilo per day per body weight, which you'll see will be important in a minute in terms of our studies. In the USA, for once, they've actually done something maybe a little bit better than here, uh, and they've actually lowered um, this, and so you can, only three parts per billion are allowed in drinking water compared to the European Union. Since 2003, atrazine has actually been banned because of concerns around health and its prevalence in the water system. So we know um, from all of this exposure and many, many studies that there's a lot of evidence that infers um, that there's a negative effects on growth and development and specifically reproduction, which we'll be talking about now. So how was atrazine first discovered? Um, that was a very interesting story in itself. So Tyrone Hayes um, from UC Berkeley, um, he was at that point working for the company and, and really researching uh, into the feminization of male frogs who were living in environments where atrazine was very, very high concentrations in the water. This in itself led to a very, very publicized smear campaign between the researcher and then his ex-employers in terms of trying to whistleblow this area. And so if you've got some time, it's well worth a listen and, and a read on Wikipedia. But from this and, and then subsequent studies, we know that um, atrazine has an, an anti-androgenic implication, which means when we have testosterone in our body, it acts in two ways. First of all, it will actually block the conversion of testosterone into a more potent uh, dihydrotestosterone, which is usually what's acting on our reproductive tract. It also increases the expression of this enzyme aromatase to drive more estrogen in the system, so it has a dual function. Other studies have also shown that upstream of testosterone, it can block the action of um, some of the compounds produced by our brain. Um, and so we have quite a nasty array of ways that it can actually affect the steroid pathway. As I mentioned, then atrazine is also an endocrine disruptor, I'm sorry, a metabolic disruptor. And so it can do this by dissociating the electron transport chain in the mitochondria, which leads to oxidative damage. So generally this results in metabolic effects. So we get things like fatty liver syndrome and nice round mice like this, um, as it's a well-known obesogen. So really uh, atrazine has both an endocrine and a metabolic effect. So one of the studies that I want to talk to you about first is an in vitro study using the bovine embryo and from abattoir derived material. And we wanted to look at the environmental concentrations and whether these actually affected the pre-implantation embryo development and metabolism. So the three uh, control or three groups that we set up were the control with no exposure to atrazine, a low atrazine, and I should say when I say low, I mean they're all environmentally relevant concentrations, and this was actually a conservative level based on those recorded in Australian waterways. For our high and environmentally relevant concentration, then we chose what was deemed to be the safe concentration by the NHMRC and those that are used to derive the um, Australian water guidelines. So what did we do, or rather what did one of my students do? Um, we collected eggs from the abattoir, um, 7,000, nearly 500 of them. We cultured them in vitro by fertilizing them with sperm and looking at embryo development. And on day eight, or sorry, day 3.5, which is the eight cell, this is when the embryo itself turns on its own genome. After that, we then put them into the three different treatments. Um, and then on day 7.5, at the blastus stage of embryo development, we collected the embryos and assessed them for a number of parameters. And we did this over 21 cultures. So the endpoints that we were looking for for this day 7.5 blastus stage was really um, the number that developed, 
the, the stage at which they were at that time point, their quality and their cell number. All of these parameters are well known to indicate the quality um, and the likelihood of changes in utero um, and are very good proxies. So uh, this nearly broke my student at the time, but there was no change in the three after undertaking all of that work. But probably that's to be expected because we are using environmental levels, so we're not going to see toxic effects outright. But we did start to see changes in the embryo number. And by embryo number, I mean the total cell number. So this is an embryo where we've stained it. And you can see all of these individual cells. Um, and so we could see that actually when we did this, we saw a decrease in the amount of total cells in an embryo. So here's our control here. You can see we've got about 165 cells, decreasing to about 150 cells in both the environmental concentrations of atrazine, knowing that they could actually directly affect the cell number. So within the embryo, we know there are two different types of cells. So we wanted to see what type there were at this stage. Um, the blue cells that are stained up here become the actual fetus itself, and they're known as the inner cell mass. And then the external cells here are actually the trophoblasts that become the placenta. And then when we did this study, we were able to understand that actually it was a decrease in these outer cells that become the placenta that were really being dramatically affected by exposure to the atrazine concentrations. The next thing we wanted to look at, because we knew it's a metabolic um, effector as well, was to repeat the same scenario that we had here, um, but this time look at a metabolic output for these embryos. Um, this was um, looking specifically from culturing embryos that are about day 6.5 to 7.5 and looking at their metabolic turnover. So what this meant was, as I said, it was a 24-hour culture, moving it from this compact morula stage embryo to this blastocyst stage embryo. And then in this known concentration of media, we're then able to recover that day 7.5 blast cyst, and we take it out so we have our spent media. The embryo is then obviously stained so we can count the total cell number. And then the spent media is subjected to a fluorometric assay so we can, con we can calculate the concentration of glucose consumption and lactate production. And don't worry too much, that's just for anyone who wants to geek out on uh, the actual reaction. So in terms of what we found, um, then you can see that at the high concentration that's environmentally relevant, we saw that these embryos were utilizing more glucose in order to survive per, per picomoles per cell per hour. Um, and also, of course, output-wise, this was also seen in the amount of lactate that was produced, showing that actually even exposure from day 3.5 to 7.5, so only four days in exposure to the atrazine concentration could affect the metabolism of these embryos. So in summary, um, I was just looking at the environmentally relevant concentrations and can they affect embryo health? No, when it comes to looking at the number that we had or the stage they were at or the quality they were at. But when you start looking a little bit closer at this, you can see that we change and decrease um, the number of cells, the allocation changes. So we have less of those outer cells and we also increase the metabolic turnover in these embryos. So that was in the bovine system and that can show, and we know that actually these are very good proxies for later life consequences and um, through the DOHAD phenomenon in terms of the programming of this early embryo for later life health. So then as we've already proved that into an in vitro model, we wanted to see what would happen if we did it in the male um, and if we actually expose the whole animal to this. And so before the studies that I'm about to talk to you about, there have been a number that have been published to look at how atrazine affects the male reproductive system. We know, for example, that exposure of atrazine in the drinking water to these animals changes the um, concentration of testosterone and increases estrogen, changes the testes itself, and it alters the sperm characteristics in terms of a decrease in the number, increase in the percentage of uh, dead, increase in abnormalities, also changing a lot of the gene expression in these tissues. But these previous studies, of course, have been undertaken at very, very high doses, so more like toxicological studies, and we really wanted to see what was happening at that environmentally relevant concentration. So for our first study, we exposed mice from weaning, so about three weeks of age until 12 weeks of age, um, in the, through their water at the concentrations based on those levels that we knew were the NHMRC um, level for safe drinking water and a tenfold higher. We found that the atrazine affected an increase of percentage of dead sperm and it did actually change the testis gene expression. But there was no change in embryos created from these males when they were mated with unexposed females, um, so there was actually no difference. But of course that's a very narrow window of exposure from only three weeks of age to 12 weeks of age and we know that actually probably a lot of the exposure is likely to have a detrimental effect if it's happening in utero and actually have more pronounced effects on the male phenotype. <clears throat> 
So the second follow-up study was to really begin much earlier with the exposure prenatally um, during that gestation. And when we did this, we found that there were no changes um, in testis morphology, which of course you shouldn't necessarily see at these low concentrations. Again, we saw a decrease in sperm concentration. And again, we saw the, the changes in the gene expression um, in the testis and also a metabolic effect in liver function um, that we saw. In terms of fertility, then we saw no change in fertilization and compaction blastis rates when those males were mated with unexposed females. But again, similar to with the bovine system, we saw this change in the number of cells in terms of what was happening. And again, we saw a decrease in the outer cells, those pink trophoblast cells that become the placenta. So overall, there was less cells in the embryo. So in summary and conclusion, in terms of the, the studies that I've shown you through different models, when we look at the acute exposure of atrazine uh, in vitro for that four days in the bovine system, we can see a direct effect on the total cell number, which was driven by a decrease in the placental cells on the outside, and we saw an increase in the carbohydrate metabolism. In terms of the chronic um, atrazine exposure with the in vivo mouse studies, when we looked at the multi-generational effects on the F1 embryos, so the first generation embryos, um, from weaning to 12 weeks, there were really not much effects. But when we actually increased the exposure from a beginning in utero all the way to 12 weeks, this is when we saw the same result that we saw with the in vitro model, verifying that both in vitro and in vivo, we could see this effect on the embryo. So in summary, we're able to say, and that the environmental atrazine levels negatively affect embryo characteristics that affect both the current and the future generations, which therefore leads us to ask, um, is the concentration that we currently deem safe in our waterways uh, really needing to be reassessed with respect to all life stages in terms of um, the embryo and the pregnant female, rather than deriving this data from adult male animals in the first place? So finally, I just want to say, what does this hold for the future? Hopefully it's not quite as grim as my friend Offred's telling us here, um, but we better be praise, praise be for that fertility. Um, so I think we need to understand for atrazine and many of the endocrine disruptors in terms of the effects on wildlife and fertility, um, because of course we're seeing crashes in populations in conservation. And I'm currently undertaking work looking at female fertility in a number of animals, in, um, and that includes wildlife. In terms of human fertility, um, as we know, and I've highlighted earlier in the talk, then we see an association with increases in infertility and diseases. And so there's other studies going on to really identify further the mechanisms behind this. And so there really now is a greater reliance on assisted reproductive technologies. So one in six couples in Australia now require ART in order to have a baby. And so it's thought that a lot of the unexplained infertility that we're suffering is probably from exposure for endocrine disrupting chemicals. I've also produced some fact sheets and um, that are widely available for doctors and patients. Um, so if you want to find out more about what are the effects on um, EDCs and human fertility, um, then by all means do um, search the Your Fertility site. And with that, I just want to thank those involved with the study. So my long suffering students um, who I nearly broke from finding very little to start with, but thankfully they picked up uh, and all the other collaborators and those involved with providing tissue and also um, the bovine study for the sponsorship. Thank you very much.